हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू द पेनल्टीमेट लेक्चर ऑफ द लास्ट वीक ऑफ दिस कोर्स एज सच दिस इज द ट्वेंटी एथ लेक्चर ऑफ दिस मैसिव ओपन ऑनलाइन कोर्स ऑन फिलोसफिकल फाउंडेशन ऑफ सोशल रिसर्च वी हैव ऑलरेडी कवर्ड सेवन वीक्स ऑफ दिस कोर्स एंड नाउ वी आर इन द एट्थ वीक ऑफ ऑफ दिस कोर्स in terms of two lectures in this week what we are going to do we are going to discuss begin beginning of the end of the philosophy of social sciences uh, i mean we do not believe in the the epistemology the methodology we do not believe in the philosophy of of social sciences and then we'll provide an overview of the course okay now in this lecture we are going to discuss philosophy of the social sciences how this can be captured in term i mean philosophy of the social sciences can be captured uh, in terms of this this five uh, parameters but but before doing this this the the philosophy of i mean philosophy of the social sciences can be described broadly as having two aims one is descriptive and the other prescriptive or normative when i say descriptive aim philosophy of the social sciences seeks to produce a rational reconstruction of of social sciences this entails describing the philosophical assumptions that underpin the practice of social inquiry just as the philosophy of natural science seeks to lay bare the methodological and ontological assumptions that guide scientific investigation of natural phenomena secondly when i say prescriptive or normative philosophy of the social sciences seeks to critique the social sciences with the aim of enhancing their ability to explain the social world or or otherwise mm, improve our understanding of it thus thus philosophy of science is is uh, or philosophy of social sciences is both descriptive as well as prescriptive or normative in nature as such it concerns a number of interrelated questions what are these questions then? these include what is the method of social sciences or what may be the possible methods of social sciences does social science use the same methods as natural science if not should i should it aspire to or are the methods appropriate to social inquiry uh, fundamentally different from those those of natural sciences is scientific investigation of the social world even possible if it is possible is it desirable okay what type of knowledge does social inquiry produce can the social sciences be objective can the social sciences be neutral can the social sciences be value neutral should they should social sciences strive to be objective should social sciences strive to uh, be value neutral or can the social world represent a unique realm of inquiry with its own properties and laws or can the regularities and their their properties of the social world be reduced to facts about individuals in this lecture what we are going to do will will survey how philosophers of social sciences have addressed and debated these questions we will we'll discuss in in this lecture what we are going to do we are going to discuss uh these questions against the backdrop of of these five parameters one naturalism 
and the unity of scientific method, two, critics of naturalism, three, methodological individualism versus holism, four, what do social sciences do and five, methodological pluralism. Okay? In, in terms of these five parameters, let us discuss one by one. We will start with naturalism and the unity of scientific method. Okay? What is this? The achievements of, of the natural sciences in the wake of the scientific revolution of the 17th century in England have been most impressive. Their investigation, their investigation of nature has produced elegant and powerful theories that have not only greatly enhanced understanding of the natural world, but also increased human power and control over it. For example, modern physics has shed light on such mysteries as the origin of the universe and the source of the sun's energy and it has also spawned technology that has that has led to supercomputers, nuclear energy and bombs and space exploration. Natural science is manifestly progressive in so far as over time its theories tend to increase in depth, range and predictive power. Okay? It is also consensual, that is in the sense that there is general agreement among natural scientists regarding what the aims of science are and how to conduct it, including how to evaluate theories. At least in the long run, natural science tends to produce consent regarding which theories are valid. Given this evident success, Many philosophers and social theorists have been eager to import the methods of natural science to the study of the social world. If social sciences were to achieve the explanatory and, uh, and predictive uh, power of natural science, it could help solve vexing social problems such as violence and poverty, improve the importance of institutions and generally uh, foster human well-being. Those who believe, those who believe that, that adapting the aims and methods of natural sciences to social inquiry is both possible and desirable, support the unity of, support the unity of scientific method. Okay? And such advocacy in this context is also referred to as naturalism. Those who suggest that no social sciences must follow the methods of natural sciences, okay? They and those who say that, uh, those who suggest that no social inquiry, the, the the I mean social sciences must follow the methods of natural sciences, and they support the unity of scientific method, okay? Such advocacy in this context is also referred to as naturalism. Of course, the the effort to unify social and natural science, it requires reaching some agreement on or about what the aims and methods of science are or should be. That is why we said R means what, what should be the, uh, what, what are the methods of science? They are descriptive in nature. What are the, uh, what should be the methods of science? They are prescriptive or normative in nature. Okay? We have also, we have already discussed positivism uh, in the beginning of this course. In this context, positivism is very important. An analysis of positivism's key doctrines is well beyond. I am I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discuss fully positivism here because we have already discussed this. The, the genesis, the genesis of, of positivism can be traced to the ideas of uh, British empiricists of the 17th and 18th century. Uh, including most notably John Locke, George Berkeley and David Hume. As an epistemological doctrine, we have seen how empiricism in essence holds that genuine knowledge of the external world must be grounded in experience and observation. In the 19th century, we have also discussed how August Comte who coined the term 
positivism argued that all theories, concepts or entities that are incapable of being verified empirically must be purged from scientific explanations. The aim of scientific explanation is prediction as, as August Comte argued uh, rather than trying to uh, understand a numeric uh, uh, um, a nominal uh, a realm that lies beyond our senses and, and is thus unknowable. If we cannot experience something, if we cannot see something, if we cannot observe something, that, then that's, that's, that, that, that's not real according to positivist empiricists. Okay? And that is why we have also discussed how rationalists said, suggested that no, science begins only when we go beyond observations. I mean, on the contrary, what, what positivists and empiricists suggested that no, science begins with observations, uh, must remain at the level of observations and must end with observations. But what rationalists suggested that no, science begins only when you go beyond ob observations. I mean, that is how science becomes transobservational in nature. Okay? We, have also, we have already discussed this. Okay? For a variety of reasons, positivism began to fall out of favor among philosophers of science beginning in the later half of the 20th century. Perhaps its most problematic feature was the logical positivist's commitment to the verifiability criterion of meaning. Uh, we have also we have already discussed how, how Popper replaced uh, verifiability with falsifiability. Not only did this implausible relegate uh, a slew of traditional philosophical questions to the category of uh, meaningless, it is it also called into question the validity of employing unobservable theoretical entities, processes and forces in natural science theories. Logical positivists held that in principle, the properties of unobservables such as electrons, quarks and genes could be translated into observable effects in practice. Nevertheless, such derivations generally proved impossible and uh, reading unobservable entities their explanatory role would uh, require dispensing with the most successful science of the 20th century. Despite the collapse of, of, of positivism as a philosophical movement, it continues to exercise influence on contemporary advocates of the unity of scientific method. Though there are important disagreements amongst naturalists about the proper methodology of science, three core tenets three core tenets that trace their origin to positivism can be identified. First, advocates of naturalism remain wedded to the view that science is, is a fundamentally three core tenets when I said that first science is empirical in nature. Okay. Okay. I mean, advocates of naturalism remain wedded to the view that science is a fundamentally empirical enterprise. Second, most naturalists hold that the primary of science, the primary aim of science is to produce causal explanations. Grounded in uh, uh, law-like regularity. And finally, naturalists typically support value neutrality. The view that the role of science is to describe and explain the world, not to make any value judgment. At a minimum, an empirical approach for the social sciences requires producing theories about the social world that can be tested via observation and experiments. Indeed, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, many naturalists support this view. Okay? First proposed by Karl Popper that we have already discussed that the line demarcating science from non-science is empirical falsifiability or, or you can say uh, systematic falsifiability. According to this view, if there is no imaginable empirical test that could show a theory to be false, then it cannot be called a scientific theory. 
producing empirically falsifiable theories in turn necessitates creating techniques for systematically um, and precisely measuring the social world. Much of the 20th century social sciences involved in, in uh, involved the formation of, of such tools including figuring out ways to operationalize social phenomena that is conceptualize them in such a way that can be measured. The data produced by operations in turn produce the raw empirical material to construct and test theories. At the practical level ensuring that that scientific theories are subject to proper empirical rigor requires uh, establishing an institutional framework through which a community of social scientists can try to test each other's theories. And thus you will find the purpose of a theory according to naturalists is to produce causal explanations of events or regularities found in the natural and social worlds. Indeed, this is the primary of aim of science according to naturalists, according to the proponents of naturalism. For, for, for instance, you will, you, will, you will find astronomers may wish to explain the appearance of Halley's comment on at regular intervals of 75 years or they might want to explain a particular event as such as the collision of the comet. Scientific explanations of such regularities or events in turn require identification of law like regularities law. Okay? Law like regularities that govern such phenomena. An event or regularity is formally explained when its occurrence is shown to be logically necessary given certain causal laws and boundary conditions. This so called covering law model thus views explanation as adhering to the structure of a deductive argument with the laws and boundary conditions serving as premises in a syllogism. Okay? We have, if, if, you, uh, if some question arises about deductive, I mean uh, immediate, uh, I mean immediate deductive inference and so on, we will, we'll, we can discuss in the question answer session when, when uh, I mean weekly question answer session we can discuss this. Thing. The, the, the doctrine of the doctrine of value neutrality is grounded in, in the so called fact value dichoto dichotomy, fact value distinction that we have already discussed in the, in the, in the central tenets of positivism which traces its origins to David Hume's claim that an ought cannot be derived from an each. Okay? I mean normative questions cannot be derived from descriptive questions. That is factual statements about the world can never logically compel a particular moral evaluation. Okay? For instance, based on scientific evidence, biologists must conclude that violence and competition are natural human traits. But such a factual claim itself does not tell us whether violence and competition are good or bad, they are moral questions. According to advocates of naturalism, the same holds true for uh, claims about the social world. For instance, political scientists might be able to tell us which social, political and material conditions are conducive to the development of democracy. But according to this view, a scientific explanation of the causes of democracy cannot tell us whether we, we ought to strive to bring about democracy or whether democracy itself is a good thing. We do not know in, as so far as the, the proponents of naturalism are concerned. Okay? Science can help us better understand how to manipulate the social world to help us achieve our goals, but it cannot tell us about those goals or uh, tell us what those goals ought to be. To believe otherwise is to fall prey to the so called naturalistic fallacy. Okay? And in this, in this context, what what we are we are trying to do here the i mean uh, when i say naturalistic fallacy uh, nevertheless value neutrality okay uh, does not bar social scientists from providing an account of the values that individuals hold 
or not nor does it prevent them from trying to discern the effects so that values might have on individuals behavior or social phenomena as a matter of fact max weber we have we have already discussed a central figure in late 19th and early 20th century sociology and a defender of of value neutrality in his uh, uh, the methodology of the social sciences uh, insisted that that providing a rich account of individuals values is a is a key task for social scientists at the same time he maintained that he, max weber maintained that that social scientists can and should keep their ethical judgment of people's values separate from their scientific analysis of the nature and effects of those values on nature on individuals on individual social action and so on and from here we tend to move forward move on to a critique of naturalism when we when we discuss we critics of naturalism critics of naturalism can be divided into two parts one the the absence of logic and interpretative interpretivism uh, and the meaningfulness of the social world again interpretivism and the meaningfulness of the social world can be classified into three types one is descriptivism hermeneutics and hidden ideology of value neutrality and hidden ideology of value neutrality uh, can be classified into two parts one is critical theory and the other post modern theory okay we will we'll discuss this naturalism has been as we have been we have discussed naturalism has been highly influential in the social sciences especially since the middle of the 20th century and particularly in the united states of america movements to make social inquiry genuinely scientific have dominated many fields most notably political science and economics however whether these efforts have been successful is contestable and naturalism has been subjected to wide ranging criticism some critics point to what they view as formidable obstacles to subjecting the social world uh, to to scientific investigation these these include the possible absence of social laws social uh, law like uh, regularities at the social level the complexity of the social environment and the difficulty of con conducting controlled experiments these represent practical difficulties nevertheless and do not necessarily force the conclusion that modeling social inquiry on the natural sciences is doomed to failure proponents of interpretive social inquiry i mean uh, more radical critics of natural naturalism uh, argue that uh, the approach is thoroughly misconceived for example proponents of interpretive social theory Uh, uh, or social inquiry have have perhaps the most significant among such critics advocates of 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 interpretive social sciences claim that the aim of social investigation should be to enhance our understanding of a meaningful social world rather than to produce causal explanations of social phenomena grounded in universal laws in addition many proponents of interpretive social inquiry can also cast doubt on the possibility as well as the desirability of naturalism's goals of objectivity and value neutrality the the skepticism that 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 uh, that the proponents of of interpretive school of social sciences uh, have demonstrated that the the skeptics their skepticism is said by adherents of two other influential schools of social inquiry known as known as critical theory and and post modernism but opponents of of these approaches also emphasize the various ways in which social sciences can mask domination in society and generally serve to reinforce the status quo these various criticisms let us see we'll start with with absence of social logic among critics uh 
who point to practical obstacles impeding efforts to model social inquiry on the natural sciences, perhaps their most important uh, objects and um, questions, the very existence of law like regularities in the social world. The way you find laws in so natural sciences, you may not find that kind of, we cannot find this that kind of law in social sciences. They argue that the stringent criteria that philosophers of science have established for deeming an observed regularity to be an authentic law like regularity cannot be met by proposed social laws. For a regularity to be deemed a genuine law of nature, the standard view holds that it must be universal. Okay? That is, it must apply in all times and places. The second law of, suppose for example, the second law of thermodynamics is held to apply everywhere in the universe and at all points in the, in the past and future. In addition, the types of laws of most importance to science are causal laws. Explanation, right? A law may be described as causal as opposed to a mere accidental regularity if it represents some kind of natural necessity a force or power in nature that governs the behavior of phenomena. Whether there are genuine law-like regularities that, that govern social phenomena is not at all clear. Rather, in any event, you will find no laws governing the social world have been discovered that meet the demanding criteria of, of natural sciences. To be sure, social scientists have identified many social regularities, some of which they have even dubbed social laws. Examples from the discipline of economics would include the laws of supply and demand from political science. We, might, we may find we find Robert uh, uh, Michel's Iron Law of Oligarchy, which holds that popular movements, regardless of, of, of how democratically inclined over time, will become hierarchical in structure. Another proposed law of politics in um, uh, Juber's law, which posits the two-party system will emerge in political systems that feature simple majority, single ballot electoral systems. But upon closer inspection, these laws fail to meet the criteria or for genuine law-like regularities that we have found in natural sciences. Okay? Sometimes particularly in economics, which boasts more purported laws than the other social sciences, the laws merely describe logical relationships between concepts. These laws may be true by definition, but because they do not describe the empirical world, they are not scientific laws. On the contrary, social laws that, that claim to describe empirical regularities invariably turn out to be imprecise, exception-ridden and time-bound or place-bound rather than precise and universal. Consider the law of demand from economics which holds that consumer demand for a good will increase if prices go up and increase if prices go down. Though this pattern typically occurs, it is not without exception. Sometimes increasing the price of a good also increases the demand for it. This may happen when consumers interpret a higher price uh, as signaling higher quality or because purchasing an expensive good provides an opportunity for conspicuous consumption. Wasteful expenditure as a display of status. Moreover, the law of demand is a weak law. It merely specifies an inverse relationship between price and demand, unlike the unlike the more price laws of, uh, uh, unlike the more precise laws of uh, natural science, it does not specify the magnitude of the expected change. You can go ahead with many, many other examples like rational choice theory and so on. Okay. That, that you will find that the kind of law-like regularities that we may find in natural science, you may not find in the case of social sciences. Okay. When, when we come to, you can, you can look at, uh, I mean, uh, examples from, uh, from uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Adam Smith, August Comte, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, uh, as well as uh, the numerous advocates of behaviorism or positivism and positivism in the 20th century. 
um, but in the end the consensus on method and 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 the hope for uh, and the hoped for scientific progress have failed to materialize today and therein lies the significance of interpretive school of social sciences uh, advocates of of interpretivism uh, uh, this okay uh, propose an approach to social inquiry grounded in profoundly different assumptions about those about the nature of of the social world than those who support naturalism in particular the proponents of interpretive school of social sciences assert that the social world is fundamentally unlike the natural world in so far as the social world is is meaningful in a way that the natural world is not this difference can be made clear by considering a difference between human action and the behavior of entities or systems found in the natural world if we have to compare human action on the one hand and 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 the study of nature on the other then we'll find that there is an action by an individual that we wish to explain for example voting at a school board meeting for a particular proposal imagine that the individual votes for a measure by raising his hand the act of voting entails more than a particular physical movement however in fact in different situations the same physical behavior of hand raising could indicate different things posing a question if i simply raise my hand i may raise it indicates maybe i want to pose a question maybe i want to vote for somebody's some proposal uh maybe i will point to the ceiling um, yawning and so forth thus to adequately explain a person's the person's behavior it is not enough to explain the physical processes that caused the 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 hand raising as a, as a matter of fact indeed in most cases of of social inquiry what we generally find that the physical processes will be irrelevant to the explanation of the behavior rather what is required is an account of the meaning behind the acts that's why weber suggested no that value rational social acts and goal rational social acts and they are meaningful social acts why no because they are reflexive in irreflective in nature okay in this example that would be an account of what the person meant by raising his hand or her hand uh, namely to vote there is no equivalent type of explanation in the physical sciences astronomers for instance might might wish to explain the orbital path of a comet to do so they cite relevant natural laws and conditions that produce the comet's orbital trajectory but the motion of the comet has no meaning per se in need of explanation okay what implication does the meaningful nature of the social world have the have for the methods and aims of social inquiry according to the inter according to interpretivists it implies that the key aim of social inquiry should be to enhance our enhance our understanding of the social world's meanings as opposed to producing causal explanations of social phenomena then there there are there are two worlds to to there are two ways to produce uh knowledge one is explanation and the and the other understanding explanation uh was propounded by positivists by naturalists and understanding is propounded by by the school of uh i mean uh, by by the interpretive school okay by verstehen method okay interpretivists often compare social inquiry to textual interpretation the aim of textual when i say 
uh, when I say, uh, I mean, that understanding will have meaning serve very much embedded uh, in social action and and when when we tend to uh, attach meanings to our action uh, therein lies the significance of understanding um, and and the kind of interpretation that we tend to do that is value interpretation textual interpretation if i have to say uh, that that interpretivists tend to um, often compare uh, social inquiry to textual interpretation. The aim of textual interpretation is to make sense of a novel play, essay, a religious document or other text by laying bare the beliefs, intentions, connections and context that comprise their meaning. Similarly, interpretivists suggest that the aim of social inquiry to, to the, the aim of social inquiry should be to make sense of the actions, beliefs, social practices, rituals, value systems, institutions and other elements that comprise the social world. This involves uncovering the, the intentions and beliefs that inform human action, which in turn requires make sense of the, uh, which in turn requires making sense of, of the broader social context in which those, those beliefs, intentions and and actions reside. And, and such such interpretive social sciences, okay, they, they, they have been foregrounded, okay, in terms of these three perspectives, uh, I mean three parameters, one is descriptive, descriptivism, uh, secondly hermeneutics, thirdly hidden ideology of value neutrality. Please do not think that they are, they are separate, but they, 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 for, for just for the sake of convenience, I have tried to classify them. Interpretive theory, interpretive school uh, has drawn much of its inspiration from the fields of cultural anthropology and ethnomethodology, the study of how people make sense of their everyday life. Okay, when we when we say descriptivism, we look at cultural anthropology, ethnomethodology, okay. I mean the study of, of how people make sense of their everyday world. Indeed, some advocates of interpretive social inquiry wish to make the aims and methods of these ap approaches the exemplar of all social inquiry. Like Garfinkel, Harold Garfinkel, who, who precisely advocated for ethnometrology. A key, a key goal of cultural anthropology, for example, is to make sense of the beliefs, norms, practices and rituals of foreign cultures. For example, suppose an anthropologist uh, wishes to explain a particular religious ceremony practiced by a hunter-gatherer tribe. According to interpretivists, the aim of such inquiry has nothing to do with, with identifying relevant law-like regularities or causal mechanisms that govern the ceremony, nor should the litmus test of a successful explanation uh, be the ability to uh, uh, the, uh, the to, to generate predictions about the tribe's behavior in the ceremony, although the capacity to predict behavior might be a byproduct of such inquiry. Rather, the anthropologist's aim should be to make sense of the purpose and meaning of the ceremony. Naturally, this would require producing an account of how the members of the tribe understand their economy, but it would also entail placing the ceremony within the broader context of the tribe's values worldviews, practices or institutions. The, the, the end product of such investigation would be a so-called thick description. that enhances our understanding of the tribe rather than a causal explanation of their behavior. This kind of, 
of inquiry has been labeled descriptivism. Detailing of, of, of you can you can look at uh, look at uh, for, for example M N Srinivas's works, the field worker in the field, the remembered village. Okay, okay. Very detailing of of the experiences that he had had with with uh, or social change in modern India. I mean, you can go on and on. You can look at the works of Bronislaw Malinowski, A. R. Radcliffe Brown. Okay, they 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 more uh, they they depict thick description of their data, uh, uh, detailing of of the. I mean, I mean, you can find minute details of of their fieldwork. Many social scientists and philosophers acknowledge that advocates of descriptivism have identified an important uh, uh, difference between the natural and social worlds. And there is no doubt that thick descriptions of foreign cultures that the approach produces have greatly enhanced our understanding of them. This in turn has increased understanding of human society generally in so far as it has revealed great diversity of human beliefs, values, traditions and practices. However, the claim that the primary goal of social inquiry should be to produce thick descriptions has been subjected to serious criticism from advocates of naturalism and well from, uh, well I mean naturalism as well as from critics who identify with the interpretive approach. A key objection to, to descriptivism is that it would limit uh, interpretive inquiry to, to describing cultures and societies in their own terms, leaving no room for criticizing uh, the beliefs, values or self-understanding of those cultures or societies. Clearly, the objection runs, this is unsatisfactory for persons or even cultures collectively can be unaware or deeply misguided about how their societies really function and some beliefs and values operative in a society may be incoherent, contradictory, self-defeating or even delusional. Surely a primary task of, of social inquiry must be to offer accounts that, that are more penetrating and critical than descriptivism can offer. If uh, I mean, if I have to quote Charles Teller, as he said, uh, the primary aim of social investigation is to tell us what is really going on. Then descriptivism uh, falls far short of this goal. And therein lies the significance of hermeneutics tradition. An important criticism of, 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 of descriptivism uh, challenges uh, the, the, the uh, notion that the role of the social scientists is to simply to re-express the ideas, beliefs, values and self-understandings of a culture or society by adopting the viewpoint of its, uh, of its inhabitants. This criticism has been developed by advocates of an alternative and, and influential uh, version of interpretive theory that draws on the philosophical hermeneutics of continental thinkers such as Heidegger, Gadamer, uh, Ricoeur as well as Anglo-American theorists working within this tradition, most notably Teller. We have, we have already discussed, I mean, uh, uh, Gadamer and others. Uh, Gadamer, we have discussed Dilthi also, when Dilthi said that there, is a, there must be a marked difference between the study of nature on the one hand and the study of human action on the other. We have discussed hermeneutics and, and these, I mean, the, these theorists like Heidegger, Gadamer, Ricoeur and others, these theorists argue that coming to understand a culture or society or, or another individual or even a text or work or art does not involve producing an objective description of an independent object. The, in a sense that uh, philosophical hermeneutics uh, approach rejects us, uh, 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 rejects a subject-object ontology in which knowledge consists of an accurate representation of an external world in the mind of a subject. Instead, explaining the beliefs of a culture or society, whether our own or not our own, a foreign one, okay, entails a kind of dialogue with it. 
the the process of coming to understand a culture society or social practice is analogous to a conversation with another person especially one at aimed at getting to know the other person in such a conversation both participants may have their views challenged their presuppositions about the other exposed and in the process a better understanding of themselves and their con 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 conservation partner will emerge the same holds for attempts to understand whole societies or cultures according to the hermeneutical theorists uh understanding is produced through a dialectical process in which the self understanding of both parties i mean the investigator as well as the culture being studied may be transformed and in striving to explain the world view embedded in a culture its values beliefs and self definitions we must necessarily compare and contrast those beliefs values and self definitions to our own that comparative framework must be there in doing so we may come to see limitations inconsistencies contradictions um, lacuni or even plain falsehoods associated with our own world view as well as that of others understanding as as charles taylor as charles taylor uh, uh, suggested you will find that that uh, that understanding is inseparable from criticism and this in turn is inseparable from self criticism okay advocates of this philosophical hermeneutics approach like, emphasize that such interpretive inquiry may also be applied to our own world taylor for instance uh, via deep interpretive inquiry has detected a legitimation crisis at the core of contemporary western society okay that legitimation crisis also you will find in indian society today okay he argues that at the core of i mean at, i mean he argues that the instrumental i mean goal oriented instrumental and acquisitive values of modern industrial society are in contradiction with and in fact erode other fundamental western values including genuine autonomy and community hermeneutics rejection of naturalism subject object epistemology subject object ontology and its embrace of of a dialogical model of understanding also leads to a very different understanding of data in the social sciences naturalists as as taylor has argued that that, uh, that uh, naturalists uh, wish to make data univocal that is they seek to build theories grounded in data that will admit to of only one meaning and univocal data uh, allow for intersubjective agreement among scientists and thus are a key source of science's claim to objectivity in the natural sciences the goal of producing univocal data is frequently achieved natural sciences scientists do in fact often reach consensus on the meaning of data used to construct or test a theory supporters of of i mean such objectivity uh, can be refuted uh, within the hermeneutical tradition and within the tradition of hermeneutics and supporters of the hermeneutics uh, uh, tradition also emphasize that social inquiry is inherently uh, evaluative it requires both description as well as as well as explanation um, but more importantly one must understand how how this uh, 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 how uh, we cannot remain content with with ex with the world of explanation rather we must try to combine the world of explanation with the world of understanding okay okay in uh, not the way uh, the naturalists only found that no the world of explanation is adequate to explain the uh, to to understand the world to know the world but the proponents of hermeneutics suggested that no there is a marked difference between the study of nature on the one hand and the study of human action on the other and when i said uh, the world of explanation i mean i refer to the world, the study of nature and when i say the the study of human action i refer to the study uh, i mean the hermeneutic studies okay the i mean these these things uh, are important to abandon many important questions that social scientists scientists have have traditionally sought to answer i mean the this this uh, why i said abandoning abandoning of the dichotomy between uh, or the abandoning the binary between uh, subject object and so on 
okay and and the the the, the proponents of interpretive school uh, suggested that there is always an a hidden ideology of value neutrality that people very often say that no no science is objective science is neutral science is value neutral okay two uh, two important schools of thought that reject naturalism as critical or critical theory and and postmodernism both of these approaches i agree that social inquiry must be in part interpretive they also agree with advocates of hermeneutics that interpretation is an inherently uh, evaluative activity thus they reject naturalism's goal of value neutrality their most important contribution to the critique of value neutrality lies in their exploration of the various ways that social sciences can serve to legitimate and reinforce oppressive values beliefs and practices and thereby mask domination far from being far from being unbiased uh, value neutrality re represents a hidden ideology according to the interpretive school okay then then let us discuss critical theory quickly critical theory you will find uh, traces its origins to the frankfurt school founded in the 1920s in germany which included such thinkers like theodor adorno uh, max horkheimer herbert marcuse habermas and so on coming out of the marxist tradition members of this school took heart to marx's famous conclusion from his thesis on fairback fairback that that the last thesis thesis 11 uh, philosopher the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways the point however is to change it marx used his efforts to explain the inner workings of capitalism and the logic of history as a scientific endeavor but he also saw social inquiry as necessarily intertwined with critiquing society and ultimately liberating mankind from oppression following in this vein the original critical theorists argued that a social scientist should not and cannot be neutral observer of the social world thus the frankfurt school so, sought to retain the social criticism intrinsic to 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 marxism while distancing their approach from the uh, rigidified orthodox version of the doctrine that popped up the totalitarian system in the in the erstwhile soviet union in in place of orthodox marxism they aimed to produce a new theory that could at once explain the failure of socialism in the western liberal democracies and also provide a critique of what they saw as oppressive features of developed capitalist societies okay then then a critique that that nothing is neutral nothing nothing is objective today critical theory encompasses a broader group of social theorists than solely the contemporary descendants uh, descendants of the frankfurt school use of the term has has expanded to include many other approaches such as feminism and other liberation ideologies that that claim to offer both a systematic explanation and critique of economic social and political structures institutions or ideologies that are held to oppress people the aim of critical theory is human emancipation and this is accomplished in part by laying bare structural impediments to genuine freedom contradictions and incoherences in people's beliefs and values and hidden ideologies that that mask domination okay for critical theorists the sources of domination and false consciousness are wide ranging those in the marxist tradition for instance explore how the values beliefs i mean hierarchies uh, generated by capitalism served to keep the working class deluded and exploited feminist critical theorists for example examine how patriarchal values which they find are deeply embedded in in contemporary institutions legal systems and social values serve to keep women subordinate when 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 we come to when we come to postmodernism uh postmodernism i mean uh, uh the 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 adherents of 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 postmodernism have also been critical of of the claim of social sciences to to value neutrality and and again like critical theorists they tend to see social sciences as a potential source of domination while postmodernism is, is is a rather uh, a loosely defined category with the views and thinkers associated with it varying widely 
some key tenets of the approach can be identified. Central among them is cultural and, and historical relativism. Cultural and historical relativism. Okay. According to postmodernists, what counts as knowledge and truth, they must be if knowledge or truth must be evaluated in the context of cultural and historical relativism. Okay. I mean uh, when you when you discuss uh, uh, postmodernism, you must dis I mean we, we must try to understand postmodernist construal of knowledge or truth in the context of of questioning the project of enlightenment in questioning the project of modernity as an institution and so on. In questioning the knowledge, in questioning the epistemology, okay? there cannot be the epistemology, there cannot be the knowledge, I mean the, 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 the knowledge that we talk about, the epistemology that we talk about is always constructed and so on. Okay? And that is how, if that is constructed, that is how they, they have always tried to bring about a critique of, of, of natural knowledge. Then, then let us say how uh, methodological individualism versus holism, you will find that, that we have already discussed methodological individualism in the, in the context of, of, of Weber uh, and holism also as a, as a counter to, to that. Uh, Weberian standing, uh, Weberian standing of methodological individualism. Okay, what we'll do? What we'll do? I mean, we are going to discuss methodological individualism. What social sciences? What do social sciences do uh, in terms of? Uh, I mean, in uncovering facts, correlation analysis, and identifying mechanisms, and methodological pluralism. In the next lecture, uh, with an overview of the course broadly and there we will we'll, we'll give a closer to this course. Uh, then what have we discussed today? We have discussed how philosophy of the social sciences, I mean there is, there is, a, there is a beginning, there is, there, there, it marks a beginning of the end of the philosophy of the social sciences. Okay? We do not believe in the epistemology, the, uh, uh, the knowledge, the truth or something. Okay? it is subject to interpretation and so on. I mean, how philosophy of social sciences seeks to uh, uh, bring about a rational reconstruction of social sciences, uh, which is descriptive in nature and what is more important, which is prescriptive or normative in nature to bring up in bringing about a critique of the social sciences. We have, we have discussed, I mean, the aim of this, 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 this week's lectures is, is to is to look at uh, uh, philosophy of the social sciences broadly okay in terms of five parameters one naturalism and the unity of scientific method secondly critics of naturalism thirdly methodological individualism versus holism fourthly what do social sciences do and fifthly methodological individualism in this in this lecture in today's lecture we have we have discussed naturalism and the uh, unity of scientific method and and critics of naturalism in terms of absence of social laws and interpretivism and the meaningfulness of the social world. In the next lecture, we are going to, I mean, in, in the last, I mean, we are going, uh, uh, that will be our last lecture of the course. What we are going to do, we are going to discuss methodological individualism versus holism. What do social sciences do in terms of uncovering facts, correlation analysis and, and in identifying mechanisms and methodological pluralism and then we will provide an overview of the course. Thank you.